Parliament passing it, it still has some process to go here. Um, we're, uh, we're certainly watching this real closely, and uh, we would have to take a look at whether or not there might be um, uh, repercussions that we would have to take, per per perhaps in an economic uh, way, uh, should this law actually get passed uh, and enacted. Um, and that would be really unfortunate because uh, so much of the economic assistance that we provide Uganda is health assistance and largely through PEPFAR. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you can see a world in which you know, a, a law like this, should it be enacted, would not only, as, as Kareen rightly said, just be devastating to a whole community of people inside Uganda, but, uh, but if it were to have any kind of an effect uh, uh, on our economic assistance that would only make that worse. So we'll have to take a look, no decisions. We're watching this very, very closely, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, it, it won't pass and we won't have to do anything. I'm, I'm so, sorry, I had a second one. Uh, back on the um, depleted uranium issue, has the U.S. sent any depleted uranium ammunition to the Ukrainians? Would it do so? And, just, and, and secondly, uh, what, what do you make of the Russian and better Russian kind of veiled threats about using some sort of, you know, going nuclear themselves. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of what they're saying. They're saying if you use a little bit of nuclear, we could go nuclear. That, they've been saying that. Lukashenko said You mean in, in reference to the depleted uranium? Yeah. Has the U.S. sent any of this stuff itself? So, look, we don't um, typically talk about the specifics of ammunition that we're providing, but we're not providing uh, depleted uranium. Uh, but I think it's important uh, mm -hmm. to, to remember what this is. And this is... Uh, there have been health studies done on depleted uranium munitions. It is not a radioactive threat. It is not anywhere close to going uh, into the nuclear realm. That's why I said it, described it earlier, as a stake through a straw man. Um, uh, this is a commonplace type of munition that uh, is used particularly for its armor-piercing capabilities. Uh, so, again, uh, the, if, if Russia is <coughs> deeply concerned about uh, the welfare of their tanks and their tank soldiers, the safest thing for them to do is to move them across the border and get them out of Ukraine. Thanks. Um, <laughs> two topics for you. Uh, first of all, on President Zelensky's visit uh, to eastern Ukraine near the front in, in, in near Bakhmut, um, what does the fact that he was able to travel there say about the strength of the Ukrainian uh, positions there? And then secondly, a lot has been made about the relative significance of Bakhmut. What does his visit say about the importance of that city for the Ukrainian forces? So interesting split screen, wasn't it, Jeremy? You had the president of Ukraine going to, a, literally to a town that's been under assault now for weeks, where thousands uh, of Ukrainian soldiers have fought, um, and many have died, as well as tens of thousands, we estimate, uh, Russian uh, convicts. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's where the most vicious fighting is going on. And he goes there. The other day, Mr. Putin decides to go to Mariupol, which is about as far away inside Ukraine from any fighting as you can get, um, uh, to inspect the reconstruction uh, after the damage his army did uh, to, to Mariupol. Um, President Zelensky has uh, made very clear that he wants his forces to keep fighting over uh, and for Bakhmut, uh, and they haven't given it up. The Russians have made some incremental gains in the last few days, but only incremental. I mean, we're talking block by block kind of stuff, uh, and the Ukrainians are still fighting very bravely to, to try to prevent uh, Bakhmut uh, from falling. I'll let President Zelensky describe his strategy and what he wants to prioritize and how he wants his troops to fight and, and where. But uh, a noteworthy, yet another example uh, of his uh, incredible leadership under fire uh, as a commander-in-chief in war, going right to where it is. That is where the, the heaviest fighting is right now in the whole country, let alone the Donbass region. And then on Israel, uh, the State Department yesterday summoned the Israeli ambassador over the repeal of this 2005 law regarding the northern uh, West Bank. The U.S. has been critical of these judicial reform efforts. Yesterday, you criticized comments made by uh, Israel's uh, finance minister. Wondering what is the current state of, of U.S. Israel relations, and how concerned is the United States that this current Israeli government is moving in a more authoritarian uh, direction, uh, and also potentially uh, putting up more impediments towards a potential two states? Israel remains a, a strong ally and a, a deep, deep friend in the region, I'd say even around the world. And the president, in his discussion with Prime Minister Netanyahu the other day over the weekend, made clear. Uh, that our support for Israel's security will remain ironclad. Nothing's going to change about that. 
Um, and he has, through his entire uh, public life, uh, been one of Israel's strongest supporters and friends, and that will not change. Uh, now, he has also said, and he's communicated it publicly, and, and of course, he's communicated it privately, our concerns uh, over uh, these proposals, these proposed judicial reforms. And he has said, and he said it again over the weekend, that we, uh, that we urge uh, Israeli leaders to, to seek a compromise as soon as possible. And then that's, that's where we are. In the back. Hi, John. Uh, getting back to the Canadian visit, uh, is one of the issues being discussed a safe third party agreement, a loophole in it is what's causing many migrants to land from, go from the United States into Canada? Is there any discussion about modernizing it? Or scrapping it. I don't want to get too far ahead of uh, of the agenda. I, th I think you know we'll have more to say uh, once we get up uh, to Ottawa, and of course the president will have a chance to talk to y'all uh, when the meeting's over. But uh, as I said in my opening statement, without question, they'll, they'll be talking about issues of migration, which affects us both. I mean, there are more people on the move in this hemisphere than there have been since World War II, and that affects both our countries. And secondly, uh, in the preview, you talked about climate change and so forth, but there was no talk about energy. Is there a push or a discussion to import oil or energy exports into the U.S. from Canada? Uh, again, I'm not going to get too far ahead of specifics. I think energy security clearly will be on the agenda, as well as clean energy jobs, uh, jobs that will be brought to the hemisphere from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, as well as, you know, the uh, Canadians have uh, an emissions control plan that they've put into place that will also help, uh, again, drive clean energy innovation here in the hemisphere, certainly between our two countries. And that's pretty exciting stuff. We're looking forward to that. Just want to if I could follow up on that, John. The, the specific concern of the Canadians is this 2004 treaty. I imagine the President's position is that he doesn't want to see a change in that treaty. But can you speak generally about the United States' position when it comes to the concerns the Canadians do have about migrants heading from this country north? And secondly, if you could lay out some of the asks you'll make of the Canadians when it comes to NORAD modernization. So on the first question, uh, we've had many opportunities to talk to our Canadian counterparts about migration concerns, and it's not, as all, it's not at all something that Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden haven't spoken about. In fact, they, we were down in Mexico City not long ago for the North American Leaders Summit, and that was a, a, a prime topic of discussion. You guys all followed up on that. Um, so I suspect that they'll continue to talk about this uh, uh, tomorrow and, and Friday. I have no, no doubt in my mind. I'm not going to get ahead of, uh, of any decisions that might be in the offing or how this might, uh, uh, might transpire. But issues of migration, we, we are well aware of Canadian concerns. We have concerns of our own. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's a shared hemispheric, a shared regional challenge. So I, I have no doubt that they'll discuss it. Um, and um, on NORAD modernization, I, I think the, uh, the, the issue of the Chinese spy balloon uh, was a, a good reminder for all of us that we need to continue to make sure uh, that uh, when it comes to our defensive capabilities, particularly our air defensive capabilities, that we are uh, at the cutting edge all the time. And so modernization of air defense capabilities, and certainly in NORAD specifically, is something that uh, we never take for granted. We're, we're always looking to, to, to improve that. You can see a lot uh, of that embedded in the, uh, in the Defense Department's budget, which has been submitted. In fact, I think they'll be testifying this week on that. Um, and I have no doubt that they'll discuss that as well. Thanks, Green. Uh, just a quick question on House Republicans asking the administration to share their review on the Afghanistan withdrawal with Congress and even the public. Is the administration considering that? Uh, so I think you know uh, that uh, we've been engaged in an effort to uh, to review the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan to assess the lessons learned. Uh, we expect to be able to share uh, those takeaways uh, with the public uh, by mid-April. And, of course, uh, uh, we also have every expectation that the agencies themselves who conducted these after action reviews uh, will be able to share the classified reports with their relevant uh, congressional oversight committees. Again, on the same basic timeline of mid-April. Oh, and one quick one, uh, your comment on the fresh set of missile strikes that we've now seen from Russia. Uh, this comes right as uh, she left um, Russia. Yeah, pretty and ironic, just, isn't it? Yeah, and, and so your thoughts on whether you think that visit has now definitively emboldened Putin? It, Mr. Mr. Putin hasn't really taken the foot off the gas since he invaded uh, a year ago. Um, he just continues to find new, brutal, violent ways to kill Ukrainians and to try to destroy Ukrainian cities, basically 
wipe Ukraine off the map as an independent sovereign nation. So it'd be hard for me to say that this visit emboldened him, but I find it pretty dang ironic. I mean, yesterday I was up here uh, reading quotes that these two leaders put out about sovereignty and UN charter and peaceful solutions and uh, cessation of hostilities. And then uh, the very next day, uh, Vladimir Putin's launching drones and cruise missiles into Zaporizhia and to Kiev, and, and as I noted, you know, killing, killing innocent civilians even just last night. Two of them were kids. Two of them were kids. So it's hard to say whether he's more uh, emboldened or not, but he certainly hasn't, uh, he certainly hasn't changed tack in, uh, in the wake of uh, all that lofty uh, rhetoric about peace and cessation of hostilities. Just one other quick one on Putin's behavior. Uh, the Russian defense minister also awarded awards of orders of courage the two pilots that were involved in yeah, the downing of the U.S. Reaper drone. You know, obviously the U.S. made it very clear that, that we found that to be unacceptable. Just what do you make of Russia portraying them as national heroes? I, I don't know of another military in the world, another air force in the world that would award a pilot for uh, smashing into a drone. If that's bravery, then I guess they got a different, a different definition of it. Uh, it's ludicrous. It's insulting. Um, now, we don't know whether that pilot was trying to intentionally ram that drone or not, but he did. Video evidence was pretty conclusive. Either way, I mean, in the, in the, in the Navy I grew up in, uh, you don't want to hit anything. Hitting anything's bad for you. So, like, I... I, I I, uh, I'm sorry. I just I got to throw the flag on this one. I have no clue why they would uh, give a, a, a bravery award uh, to to a pilot who was at worst uh, maliciously uh, uh, putting uh, himself and uh, U.S. property uh, at great risk, and at best just an idiot. Uh, thanks, Kareen. Hey, John, a, a question on Canada again. Will President Biden push Prime Minister Trudeau? Um, on an international peacekeeping force in Haiti. Uh, can you talk about what specifically, as much as you can, they plan to do yeah. on that, in that country? Uh, no, no question that they'll talk about the situation in Haiti. And, and uh, both these leaders talked about it when we were in Mexico City. Um, uh, they share a, a, a concern about the dire situation down there from a security and humanitarian perspective. Uh, this is not something that is uh, unfamiliar to either uh, the Prime Minister or, or the President. Um, I, I think they will continue to talk about ways we can continue to support from a humanitarian assistance perspective uh, the people of Haiti uh, and Haitian national security forces. Um, uh, and as for, you know, uh, a multinational force or anything like that, I, I, again, I don't want to get ahead of the conversation here, but uh, as we've said before, if, if there's if there's a need for that, if there's a place for that, uh, that's all going to have to be worked out directly with the Haitian government and with the, the UN. But I, I won't get ahead of where, what the conversation is going to be. One more, one more thing. Do you, have, you. do you have an update on Jeff Whitkey? Uh, is he back in the States? Has the president talked to him? Does he plan to talk to him? No conversations that I'm, I'm aware of. Um, you know what? I, let me check and see. I, I don't know that, that he's actually uh, arrived back here in the States. That's a good question. I owe you an answer to that. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, and thank you, John. I have uh, two questions on China and North Korea. Mm -hmm. First question, uh, does the United States view on the China and Russia economic and military and the technical cooperation agreement? And do you think this will affect the relation with North Korea? And then I follow up. In what, what, what agreement? I'm sorry? Economic and the military and technology. I'm sorry, and I missed between two, between who? Between uh, China and Russia. And China and yeah, Russia. at this time. Uh, how that will affect North, North Korea? Yeah, how would that go to? I think it remains to be seen how what effect there's going to be with uh, bilateral relations with uh, North Korea, Jenny. I, I just, uh, I think we need to dive into that a little bit more deeply mm -hmm. and, and try to under, understand it. It's, it certainly doesn't. Uh, just at face value, it, it, it doesn't appear like there will be some huge impact on uh, 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 on the way China relates to North Korea. But we've said this before, China does have influence in Pyongyang, and we continue to urge them to use that influence uh, to help us decrease uh, the tensions there on, on the peninsula and to enforce the sanctions, the international sanctions, the UN sanctions that have long been in place to, to try to curb uh, North Korea's nuclear ambitions. One more North Korea. North Korea conducted a tactical uh, 
tactical attack simulations, you know, tactical nuclear weapons simulations uh, recently. Uh, and uh, Kim Jong-un ordered to be uh, ready for a nuclear uh, attack at any time. Do you think North Korea's nuclear attack is imminent? We watch it as closely as we can. Uh, there's no indications or no information at this time that would lead us to believe that some sort of uh, actual uh, strike by uh, North Korea is imminent. But we're watching and monitoring as best we can. Again, we urge Mr. Uh, Kim to sit down uh, with the United States we, without precondition. We've made this clear, I don't know how many times, willing to sit down without precondition to talk about de-escalation of tensions and denuclear denuclearization of the peninsula. Uh, he hasn't taken us up on that offer, so we're going to continue to make sure we've got the re uh, requisite military capabilities in place. A couple more. Back on Haiti, Trudeau seems to be rejecting the idea that military force is a way to stabilize Haiti. So will you urge him, will the president urge him to reconsider? Uh, as I, I think I answered before, we're going to talk about Haiti and we're going to talk about uh, all the things that we got to continue to do for the Haitian people and for security there on the uh, uh, on, the, on that part of the island. And um, uh, as I said, any discussion about the use of military forces has got to be done. Obviously, it's got to be resonant to sovereign decisions that nations who might be contributing military forces to make. But also, it's got to be uh, uh, consistent with uh, the needs and the requirements both of the UN and the Haitian government. And I just don't think we're at a point right now where we can answer that question definitively. Thank you. I wanted to see if I could get your reaction to some news coming from Venezuela.